Well, let's discuss this historic, momentous judgment at the Supreme Court with our legal correspondent, Clive Coleman, and also Professor Jeff King from University College London, um, who's also advisor to the Lord's Constitutional Committee. Clive, um, we've heard reaction from Boris Johnson. He doesn't agree with the judgment, but he'll abide by the law. What can the government do now? Um, nothing. Basically, I mean, they can't appeal this ruling. There's no EU law, so they can't go to the European Court of Justice. There's no human rights law. They can't go to the European Court of Human Rights. Basically, what this ruling today means is that they're going to have to go back to Parliament to face the music, face the scrutiny of their Brexit plans, uh, and uh, it's, it's a, a pretty humiliating day. Professor Jeff King, you've been watching these hearings. You're an expert in uh, law. What did you make of, A, the unanimity of the judges, which not a lot of people were expecting, and also the strength, the power of their judgment and of their words? Well, the unanimity is quite unusual, and it's generally used when it's decided on the court that it's very important to send a clear message that this is what the law requires. This isn't a matter of, of a, it being a close case or a matter of political disagreement. The fact that it was so clear was also incredibly important because sometimes when there's drafting by committee, you end up watering the judgment down, focusing on some common denominator position. That wasn't the case here at all. It was, it was clear, unequivocal, and extremely harsh for the government. And, and Clive, it was stunning. I mean, people were jaws were dropping when they heard that judgment. It, it, somebody called it an earthquake, a legal earthquake. Yeah. Well, look, let me just read again because it, it's perhaps the most devastating paragraph in the entire, entire judgment. I mean. This is, you know, if there's anything more withering that's been written by a judge in recent years, I'd, li I'd like to read it. So, paragraph 61 reads, It's impossible for us to conclude on the evidence which has been put before us that there was any reason, let alone a good reason, to advise Her Majesty to prorogue Parliament for five weeks. So what they're saying is that this was done, this advice given by the Prime Minister of the United Kingdom to the monarch of the United Kingdom was done without any discernible reason whatsoever. Uh, and, uh, you know, all of this is painful for Boris Johnson, but that's particularly, particularly stinging. And, Jeff King, we know there are political consequences uh, for the Prime Minister, for the government. Well, but what does this do in broader terms for our unwritten constitution and our balance of powers between Parliament and the government and the courts? Well, I think it, it is part of a series of cases in the last 10 years which show the court emerging as a real constitutional player, as one that's not afraid to say what it thinks the law is that applies in many of the grey areas of the constitution. Those grey areas were often filled in by executive action by government, which tends to dominate Parliament in the Westminster tradition. And the courts have historically shown a lot of deference for that. But now they're taking the rule of law more seriously, I believe it's part of their role to uphold the rule of law that applies to all executive action. And some people watching this will say, well, then, if they're going to make these huge, momentous decisions, we want to know more about who these yeah. Supreme Court justices are, as we do in the United States, for example. Yeah, I mean, that, and that is a credible argument. I mean, what we've seen really since the, the early 1980s is the rise and rise and rise of something called judicial review. We've talked about it a lot, but just to reiterate, it's basically a process whereby anyone, you or I, as long as we've got the means, can go before a court and ask the court to rule on whether a decision of the, a public body could be a minister, could be the prime minister, is unlawful or not. And that inevitably has dragged the courts into the area of political decision making. In fact, a Lord Wolfe, a former Lord Chief Justice, traced it back to a time when political opposition to the government was very weak. And I not quite say that the judges jumped into the void to hold the government to account, but he goes quite far in that direction. And many people feel that if that's what they're going to do, they should be elected, they should be accountable, we should know what their opinions are. Well, what do you think about that, Jeff King? Will, will people, you know, we've had tab Lloyd papers accusing judges of being enemies of the people. Uh, you know, was this quite a, a bold decision for these 11 Supreme Court justices? Well, I think it was bold in some ways, but the fact that there was unanimity and the fact that the decision was so clear is evidence that they were absolutely convinced on the merits that the law required the Prime Minister's decision to be regarded as unlawful. And I think that's a view shared by, by many scholars and in particular many barristers at the bar. Will this mean that the judiciary will come under greater scrutiny, political scrutiny in particular? Well, I think electing them would be a total unmitigated disaster, as it has been in other countries. There is some pressure to start having sort of confirmation-style hearings in Parliament. I think that will be resisted, and the creation of the uh, Judicial Appointments Commission was a step in giving more accountability over this process to preserve the rule of law rather than to further politicize it.
Great to talk to you both. Professor Jeff King, our own Clive Coleman, thank you very much indeed.